Okay, in our video series on toxicology, in this video, we'll be talking about poisoning. By the end of this video, you would have mastered that how to approach a patient with poisoning. We'll discuss that what are the common poisons and their managements accordingly. We'll discuss that what is the general management of poisoning with an unknown substance. First of all, what is poisoning? Poisoning is injury to the body or death due to swallowing, inhaling or touching or injecting various drugs, chemicals, venoms or gases. Common cases of poisoning that you would see in emergency department include opiate overdose, organophosphates poisoning, insecticide poisoning, salicylates like aspirin overdose, carbon monoxide poisoning in winters, paracetamol overdose, beta blocker overdose in a suicide attempt, cocaine or stimulant drugs like drug of abuse, antidepressant overdose, benzodiazepine, barbiturates and alcohol overdose. These are the common cases of poisoning that you would encounter in your emergency department. We'll discuss each one of them in detail with their treatments in our toxicology series. In the diagnosis of poisoning, history is very important. If the patient is conscious, take history from the patient. If the patient is unconscious, take the history from the relatives, their attendants. Look for any tablets that were found with the patient and also take the medication history that that medicine which the patient was taking chronically. Record the time of ingestion and the time of presentation to the hospital and look for any drug of abuse that that patient was using. Coming to the toxidromes. Toxidromes are classical signs and symptoms that are seen with certain medications. If you see coma with dilated pupils and tachycardia, increased sympathetic activation, increased muscle tone, hyperreflexia, and extensor planters, upgoing planters, pause upward going Babinski sign. This means that the patient has most likely ingested tricyclic antidepressant. Tricyclic antidepressant has anticholinergic effect and it increases the sympathetic activity or orphanidrine. Orphanidrine is a skeletal muscle relaxant and its overdose can present like this. If you see coma with hypotension, respiratory depression and decreased muscle tone, it means that there is central nervous system depression and it is caused by barbiturates, clomethiazole, benzodiazepine, especially if the benzodiazepines are taken with alcohol. These all drugs cause central nervous system depression and this type of presentation is commonly seen with these things. If you see coma with slow respiration and pinpoint pupils, this is a classical triad for opiate poisoning. If you see tinnitus with deafness, and hyperventilation in the patient. Tinnitus, deafness, these are classical features of aspirin poisoning, salicylate poisoning. If you see agitation, tremor, dilated pupils with tachycardia, this is commonly found in stimulant drugs, all those drugs that increase the sympathetic activity like amphetamine, drugs of abuse like ecstasy, cocaine, sympathomimetic, serotonin syndrome. Now coming to the general management and treatment of poisoning. First and the foremost thing is ABC approach. Airway, breathing, circulation. Protect the airway, clear the airway and consider intubation, consider ventilation if the patient has Glasgow coma scale of less than or equal to 8. As I said that mostly when these patients present to emergency department, they are in a deeply comatose state. And if their GCS score is less than 8, go for intubation. If the respiratory rate is less than 8 per minute, it means that they are going toward respiratory failure and they can die of respiratory arrest. Consider intubation in such case. And if the partial pressure of oxygen is less than 60 mm of Hg, if the patient is breathing at 60% oxygen, it means that you have applied oxygen, you're giving oxygen, but that patient's partial pressure of oxygen is dropping, that patient needs ventilation. If the patient is in shock, then you have to treat it, treat it with fluid resuscitation, give ionotropes if needed. If the patient is unconscious, nurse the patient in semi-prone position. Since these patients are at risk of aspiration, you must keep them in semi-prone position to avoid aspiration of the poisons and regurgitation of the poison. 
in further management you assess the patient and take history from the patient if the patient is conscious from friends and the family perform detailed examination look for the respiratory rate look for respiratory depression check their heart rate whether there is tachycardia whether there is bradycardia that can give you the diagnosis of the type of poison that patient might have ingested look for the pupils and then send investigations look for serum glucose hypoglycemia can occur and that can lead to coma cbc electrolyte imbalances must be looked for lfts INR and ABGs, ABGs to look for acidosis. ECG must be performed to rule out any arrhythmia. Paracetamol and salicylates level can be performed if you suspect any poisoning of paracetamol or aspirin. Otherwise, urine and serum toxicology screen is performed. That urine or serum toxicology screen looks for specific poisons in the urine and blood. And then you monitor the patient, you check their temperature, you look for hypothermia. Hypothermia occur in barbiturate poisoning. All those drugs that cause CNS depression will result in hypothermia. And all those drugs that cause CNS stimulation like stimulant drugs cause hyperthermia. Look for pulse, tachycardia, bradycardia. Look for blood pressure, respiratory rate. Check their oxygen saturation. Look for their urine output with ECG. Then there are certain supportive measures that you have to do. If the patient is developing hypotension, elevate the foot end of the trolley so that there is more, more venous return, more blood flow to the brain. If the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is less than 90, give 500 ml of normal saline. And if the patient is developing recurrent hypotension, go for vasopressors and ionotropes. Then look for convulsions or seizures. If the patient is developing seizures, if the seizure was single and it was for brief time, then there is no need of giving anti-convulsion drugs because it occurs in poisoning that patient develop a single brief seizure. But if the patient is having recurrent multiple seizures, then you have to give lorazepam for MG IV. And if the venous excess is not available, then what you can do is that you can give per rectal diazepam or you can give buccal midazolam. If the patient is developing hypothermia as it occurs in barbiturates, then you have to give warm blankets to the patient. If the patient is developing hyperthermia as it occurs in stimulant drugs, then you have to lower his temperature by reducing the layers of clothing, perform active cooling. You can use uh, wet swabs. You can also use alcohol pairs and ask the patient to keep them in their armpits so that there is more uh, evaporation and cooling of the body temperature. Other than that, in very specific cases, you can go for if there is malignant hyperthermia, you can use dentroline. If the patient has urinary retention as it occurs in tricyclic antidepressant poisoning because TCAs are, have anticholinergic effect and they inhibit the micturation. So what you can do is that initially you can apply suprapubic pressure. Suprapubic massage can stimulate the micturation reflex. If suprapubic pressure fails, then what you can do is that you can perform catheterization of the patient. Coming to the gastric lavage. Gastric lavage reduces absorption of poison. In gastric lavage, what you do is that you pass a nasogastric or a orogastric tube and in that nasogastric or orogastric tube, you put 300 ml of tepid water. Then you, when the fluid has passed down to stomach, you put the plunger back in there and you suck that fluid out from the stomach. Then you remove the plunger and put the tube on the gravity effect. What happens is that due to the gravity effect, all the fluid starts coming out of the stomach. So you, you put an orogastric tube, put 300 ml of tepid water and you siphon it out by gravity effect. Gastric lavage has been a traditional part of removal of poisons and in the treatment of poisoning, but now it is not encouraged. It is not encouraged because it does not empty the stomach of the solid poisons. It does not remove the solid poison. It only removes the liquids. And then it can also force the gastric content through the pylorus of the stomach into the small intestine and lead to rapid absorption of the poisons into systemic circulation. And it can also result in aspiration pneumonia. So gastric lavage is a technique that can be used if the patient presents to you with poisoning within one hour. But after one hour, it is also ineffective and there are also risks associated with it. Emetics are the agents that induce vomiting. 
Emetics are effective if they are given within some time of ingestion of the poison. If they are given quickly after the ingestion of the poison, they are effective. If you induce vomiting soon after the patient has ingested a poison, they are effective. But usually when these patients present to the hospital, it's too late for the emetics to be used. And at that point, when they are in the hospital, when the time has passed, the risk associated with emetics are much more than the benefit. And when you have the facilities of better treatments available with you, then emetics should be avoided. We should not use emetics and especially the salt solutions that are traditionally used in patients. Salt solutions can cause fatal hypernatremia and they must never be used in these patients. Activated charcoal has a very important role in the management of poisoning. If you have the facility of activated charcoal, then these gastric lavages and emetics should be avoided. Activated charcoal can be given within one hour in the management of poisoning. After one hour, the role of charcoal is less because the poison has already passed down in the intestine has got absorbed. It reduces the absorption of many drugs and in some cases it also reduces the half-life of the drugs like in digoxin. It is very effective in digoxin poisoning. It is most useful for poisons, toxic poisons in the small quantities like TCAs, theophylines. It is available as charcoal or carbamix. Activated charcoal is given through the nasogastric tube or orogastric tube. In adults, it is given as 50 gram and in children, according to the weight, 1 gram per kg is given. Remember, activated charcoal is not effective in all kinds of poisoning. Activated charcoal do not bind certain types of drugs. Certain types of drugs like cyanide poisoning, ethanol, ethylene glycol, organophosphates, petroleum products strong acids and alkalis, lithium. In these cases, activated charcoal has no role since it does not bind to these drugs. Charcoal is very effective in the cases of opiate poisoning, salicylates poisoning, TCAs, digoxin, carbamazepine, quinine, theophylline, digoxin. Coming to whole bowel irrigation. In whole bowel irrigation, what you do is that you give so much fluid in the gut that the gut is washed out. You give fluid via NG tube and you wash the gut till the time the effluent, the effluent, the feces, the stools become clear fluid. In the procedure of whole bowel irrigation, you do not use normal saline for irrigation of the bowel. For washing of the gut, you do not give normal saline because normal saline is absorbed in the body and it causes fluid overload and hypokalemia. What you use is that you use bowel cleaning solutions like polyethylene glycol with electrolytes that comes with the name of clean prep. It is given with the dosage of 2 liter per hour in adults and it is given up to 6 hours till the time the effluent stools are clear and in children it is given 500 ml per hour. Whole bowel irrigation is useful for poisons that have sustained release like iron, lithium, sustained release in the gut, like button battery ingestion in children. Button battery also contain lithium. Packets of cocaine from body packers. In such cases, you can use whole bowel irrigation. Then coming to the antidotes, when you have properly identified the poison, when you have performed the toxicology screen or you have the history of a specific drug that has been used, in such case, you can go for antidotes. In opiates, you use naloxone, benzodiazepine, you use flomazenil, beta blocker, you use glucagon, organophosphates, you use atropine, pralidoxine, paracetamol, poisoning, you use acetylcysteine. In snake poisoning, you use antivenom. I have talked about snake poisoning in detail in my video on snake poisoning. The link of that video is in the description below. In warfarin poisoning, you use vitamin K. In cyanide, you use sodium nitrite or hydroxocobalamin, sodium thiosulfate. In methanol poisoning, you use fomipazole or ethanol. So these are the specific antidotes that are used for these types of poisoning. I have talked about management of all these types of poisoning in my toxicology lectures. Other than that, some centers also use lipid emulsification therapy. In lipid emulsification therapy, certain lipids are given IV and those lipids bind the agents, bind the poisons and remove them from the blood. Insulin therapy is also given in certain cardiotoxic poisons, in the poisons that are cardiotoxic, that are affecting the heart. What insulin therapy does is that giving insulin IV 
can increase metabolism of the heart and it improves the heart function. So insulin therapy is considered in those patients with a cardiotoxic poison. In summary, we talked about emergency care of poisoning with ABC approach and ventilation if the GCS is down. And you manage the patient, you send investigations, you monitor and you give supportive therapy. You give control the convulsions, you control hypotension, you control the temperature, and then the role of gastric lavage, role of emetics, role of activated charcoal and whole bowel irrigation. Then we talked about the specific antidotes and lipid emulsification and insulin therapy. If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on emergency medicine and toxicology lectures. The link of those videos is given in the description below. Thank you very much.